A very pleasant good afternoon to you all. So today we are on day three, and uh, today is the last day of One Health uh, webinar series jointly organized by International Veterinary Students Association, IVSA Pakhriyawa, Nepal, and uh, Young Professionals for Agricultural Development, YPR, Nepal. And um, this is me, Pema Sherpa, uh, Standing Committee Chair of IVSA Pakhriyawa, and uh, um, uh, your host and moderator for today's session and also from the management team as well and uh, today we have today we have dr inga mcdormitt today we have dr inga mcdormitt uh, bvms and with sai uh, bachelor in veterinary medicine and surgery and masters in veterinary science uh, in conservative medicine MRCVS, member of Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, and she's also working as the clinical director of the One Health Foundation. And she'll be presenting on the topic, Canin Distemper Virus, a Conservative Concern. And on our next speaker, we have Dr. Sujit Shah, who is uh, currently the researcher of NARC, Nepal Agricultural Research Council, and he's also a lecturer in Mahindra Moran campus, and he'll be presenting on the topic, international, uh, sorry, interrelationship between health, diet, and exercise. And so I'd like to welcome all the participants who are watching via YouTube, um, Facebook Live of IBSA Paklewa, our organizing committee members, and our respected speakers. Um, so now I'd like to start today's session with Dr. Inga McDormitt. So let's welcome Dr. Inga McDormitt. Uh, so McDormitt, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so, much. so I'll just... Yes, um, I'll you just can, uh, yes, you can start your presentation now. That's perfect. Right, hopefully the, the slides are sharing okay there. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, my name is, is Inga and I've been working as a small animal veterinary surgeon in Scotland in the UK since uh, 2000, so for about 20 years. And since 2015, I've also embarked on a number of um, volunteer trips where I've been involved in animal birth control or ABC projects and anti-rabies projects as well. And these have been um, included trips to India, Thailand, and also uh, obviously to come to Nepal where I've visited a number of times as well. So I've just completed my master's degree, master's of veterinary science in conservation medicine. So I wanted to discuss with you today uh, canine distemper virus, which was the topic of my final, uh, final year thesis. Um, so hopefully, there will be some interest in discussion that we can have today. So during the presentation today, we'll review the current background information on CDB and particularly looking at the risks associated with transmission to wildlife. We'll discuss free roaming dogs, looking at their um, demographics and also their cultural importance, um, but also their One Health implications as disease reservoirs. We're also going to just cover um, briefly some definitions about disease interfaces and the concept of R0 and the impact of reservoirs when we're dealing with multi-host pathogens. Before we'll conclude with some recommendations for the future and discussion over some of the possible control options for canine distemper virus. So just for some review to start then, um, canine distemper virus is a morbilli virus within the family of Paramyxoviridae. And this includes other highly pathogenic viruses like measles and rinderpest. And as with other RNA viruses, distemper is capable of undergoing mutations, meaning that it can both um, infect and be transmitted by a wide range of hosts. It was once thought of as a domestic dog disease, but now with almost worldwide distribution, it is considered a global multi-host pathogen. And by causing mortality in a wide range of species, it can pose a threat of mortality or even local extinction to endangered wildlife species. And this makes it an important disease in the field of conservation medicine. It's a highly contagious aerosol infection, which is spread by direct contact um, or, and via the oronasal or route. And this occurs in susceptible hosts, particularly when they're present in high density populations. 
And viral shedding can actually occur in both clinical and subclinical infections with a viral shedding for up to 90 days post-infection. Hosts which don't succumb to disease, so those which survive an infection, are thought to maintain a lifelong immunity. And disease has actually been eliminated in the United Kingdom following successful vaccination programmes of our, our pet dogs. We, however, don't have a big free roaming dog population in this country. So we'll just run through some of the clinical signs. The duration and the severity of clinical signs can be very variable, both with the strain of the virus and with the age and the immune status of the host. And it is actually thought as many as um, 50 to 70 percent of domestic dog infections could be clinical signs shown. So we tend to see initial colonisation of virus in the upper respiratory tract, which then spreads on to the lymph nodes. And this is associated with a febrile response, so a pyrexia or a high temperature, although this very first stage can often go un, you know, unnoticed. Animals at this stage, which mount a very strong and early immune response, may manage to eliminate the virus and display no further clinical signs. But in other hosts who have a weakened immune system, the virus continues to spread throughout the body and causes a lethargy and anorexia and is also associated with a diaphasic fever and symptoms which are associated with viral colonization of the respiratory and the gastrointestinal tract. So we will also see um, ocular and nasal discharge, sometimes coughing or even a, a dyspnea, a, a difficulty in breathing vomiting and diarrhea, and it also produces a fairly profound immunosuppression, which can often be associated with secondary or co-infections, which can worsen the animal's condition further. Viral spread can then continue on to involve the central nervous system and produce a number of CNS signs, dependent on the area of the brain or central nervous system affected. And this is caused by a demyelination of the, the nervous system that is affected. And we can expect to see neurological signs from around about 20 days post-infection. These signs, unfortunately, are normally progressive and very often do associate in, in death of the host at this stage. Animals which do recover from neurological signs are generally left with persistent neuro neurological deficits. And that's something that can be seen throughout their life. And an infection of juvenile hosts, so um, young dogs who are infected whilst their um, adult dentition is still forming, uh, suffer from what we call enamel hypoplasia. And the picture at the bottom there just shows that you can maybe see some of the uh, brown discoloured um, sort of indentations on the teeth. So these are not um, tartar or, or dental disease. These are actually a, a hypoplasia where the enamel has not been able to form properly during development. And this is an indication of a, a previous um, canine distemper exposure in a young dog. Now, our poor little dog at the top here was a case I saw when I was visiting last year. And um, this dog was positive for CDV. You can see possibly in that picture, hopefully, that we have got some ocular discharge. And this dog also suffered um, from neurological symptoms and quite a severe uh, skin secondary infection as well. Now, when we talk about those neurological signs, they can vary from full blown um, seizures um, or loss of normal motor function, or they can be much more subtle. So we'll sometimes have symptoms, um, particularly in the limbs or in the jaw, where we get a very um, repetitive and rhythmic um, neurological disturbance and I've hopefully got a little video that will just show this. So these are called myoclonus seizures and they are a classic, um, this one what we call chewing gum seizure because it affects the jaw and I just wanted to show you because they're very different from a, an epileptiform seizure so hopefully this will, will show just for a few seconds. We can see that very repetitive movement, and that's out with that, that dog's control. I'll just show you that one more time. These are the myoclonus seizures, which are fairly classic for the same paper. Okay. 
Um, there, there are a number of ways to diagnose distemper, um, both in clinic, in benchtop type rapid tests um, with ELISAs or in more high tech um, diagnostics at the laboratory. But often in our first opinion setting, um, or certainly in any NGO or field work, diagnosis will also be made presumptively on the basis of clinical signs. And CDV should be considered a differential in any unvaccinated dog, particularly in juveniles who are suffering from a multi-systemic disease, um, particularly if it's associated with a, with a febrile infection. Okay. I'm only going to touch on the main tests that are, are used for distemper. Like I say, there are many others, but um, of the main tests, we have the um, serological tests and the molecular PCR tests. And of the serological tests available, um, serum neutralization is considered the gold standard test. This has very high sensitivity and specificity for CDV, both in our domestic species, but also across a number of wildlife species as well which is important and we'll come on to that later. However, one thing we do have to always remember with serology is it does represent past infection. So it's representing antibodies from a previous infection. So it may not represent an active transmission risk. And often the serological tests are often not able to differentiate between wild type natural infection or vaccine induced antibody. So if you are dealing with a population in a highly vaccinated area, you also have to take that into account. We do, like I say, have the molecular PCR assays, which have been developed that can actually um, demonstrate CDV gene sequencing. And this can identify current circulating infection, so an actual active risk of disease transmission, and can also allow uh, differentiation of different uh, lineages of CDV and also between that vaccine antibody and the wild type CDV strains. So the reason why I wanted to speak about this today on your One Health Day was really um, to do with the wildlife aspect of it. Um, the last decades have seen disease outbreaks and mortality in many wildlife species um, and domestic dogs being the most abundant and susceptible carnivore are often important reservoirs and sources of infection to threatened wildlife. However, it is now known that certain wildlife species may also be capable of maintaining the virus and acting as part of a wider reservoir community and therefore being a source of infection to, to threatened um, carnivores and wildlife populations. So the very first wildlife um, or non-dog CDV reported case was back in 1937, which was in um, Johannesburg in a, in a zoo in a captive population. And historically, CDV was thought to not be pathogenic in felidae, so in, in cats, um, our big cats like the lion shown in the picture there. But 1994 sadly saw one of the, the biggest and probably most famous CDV outbreaks in wildlife, which coincided with the loss of 1,000 lions or a third of that Serengeti population. And that outbreak also affected um, hyenas and bat-eared foxes shown in the image there. And subsequent uh, outbreaks have also affected the endangered African wild dog. There are strong similarities between canine distemper virus and human measles virus, and there's also cross immunity between the two as well. And outbreaks of CDV have been now reported in rhesus macaque primates. And as our closest relative, although it's currently um, certainly not known or considered to be a zoonotic disease, we always have to be aware of emerging diseases and the risk of further, you know, further development or mutation. And with the popularity of, of primates, you know, and particularly around temple areas and things where this can be a, a human wildlife uh, disease interface, you know, this is something to very much be aware of for the future. Um, although, like I say, currently it's, it's not a zoonotic disease. For much of our free ranging wildlife, uh, clinical signs may be missed with diagnosis only made at postmortem. But there are documentations of ataxia and weakness uh, having been seen in African wild dogs. So, those neurological presentations 
and also um, face out, facial, sorry, facial and forelimb twitching and even full grand mal seizures in African lions. It's also been documented in um, leopards and tigers and tigers appear with when they develop neurological signs to actually lose their fear of humans and be more willing to encounter humans and approach. And this obviously has a fairly significant impact for human wildlife conflict risk. The, the mechanism of transmission to wildlife is, is not fully understood and there has been a number of hypotheses suggested. Um, virus mutation, complex reservoir and maintenance community systems, and also what we call a, a temporal variation in host immunity. So a variation in immunity over time within endemic disease cycles have all been considered. So in that um, Serengeti outbreak that I mentioned, they initially assumed that um, 1994 was, was a spillover event. So the first time that lions had encountered CDD and that this is what caused all of the fatalities. But this lion group were fairly unique in that they were incredibly well studied and there was a lot of um, data and samples that had been taken over previous decades. And when they retested those, they actually found that CDD had been present before and it had come in different cycles. So something else happened in 1994. We either had a variation in the host immunity or there may have been some other co-infections um, going on. So it's always important that we you know, have data sets where available that we can, can look back because these disease processes are often quite complex. So when it comes to our free roaming dogs, um, global dog population estimates of over 700 million have been reported and over 75% of that population are thought to be free roaming dogs. Dogs have coexisted with humans for over 15,000 years um, and, and are highly popular across many countries. And they have very varied roles within the community, from being pets and companions to being um, workers in guarding roles or hunting roles, um, and even as, as waste removal scavenger roles as well. It's estimated that around 2 million dogs are present in Nepal. And as well as the varied roles that we've discussed there, um, they obviously also hold cultural importance and will be being celebrated in your annual event of Cooker Tihar um, in your own culture. So as human population has grown and dispersed, so has the um, accidental and sometimes intentional of new um, introduction of new species to the ecosystems that, that us humans inhabit. And domestic dogs can even be considered as an invasive species when they're living completely out with human control. Rising dog numbers have posed some public health concerns, um, mainly focused around zoonotic disease like rabies and echinococcus infections. And they have seen uh, control, thankfully moving on from the, the inhumane and often ineffective culling of free roaming dogs to many of the projects that your own NGOs will be undertaking with humane dog population management um, and anti-rabies vaccination programs that some of your, your student groups may even have been involved in as well. And free roaming dogs are also now known to have negative potential effects on wildlife as well. And this can be through their interactions as prey or competitive for food sources as disease reservoirs or vectors, and even very occasionally as predators. And the actual, you know, the behavior of dogs, the nature of them being free roaming and out with human control actually increases the risk of contact with wildlife. And this is further increased when human associated settlements that have dogs um, are associated with protected areas, such as can be the case with uh, buffer zones. So that just brings us on. Um, I thought it would be worth just touching on actually disease interfaces. So, okay. so an interface is um, defined the point where two systems, subjects or organizations meet and interact. And these interacts and uh, sorry, these interactions can either be direct or indirect. And in the case of wildlife, they're more often indirect and often actually go unnoticed. For example, um, like the picture below there, 
maybe the sharing of, of water holes, of water sources, or even the sharing of a scavenged carcass can provide an opportunity for an indirect encounter and the possibility for disease transfer. So growing human population has um, led to altered lands globally, and this has caused uh, deforestation and a reduction and encroachment of our wildlife habitats. Loss of wild habitat leads to a greater crossover and interaction between our domestic and our wildlife species. And this can both lead to an increased risk of human wildlife conflict and also to disease transmission at that interface. Further to this, we have compounding problems with an illegal wildlife trade and bushmeat trade, which can provide further opportunity and increased risk for disease transmission and new spillover events to happen. So I think this is really, really current to us when we're all living through the current COVID pandemic. Um, and it really, really highlights the importance of us having this One Health understanding about disease and our relationships with um, you know, wider health and considering our use of ecosystems and um, you know, the interactions between ourselves and our animals that we share the ecosystems with. So I wanted just to run over just briefly um, a few of these concepts, which we'll, we'll all be probably a bit more familiar with, with all the COVID situation that we're hearing about. Um, so disease is a, is a complex interaction and it's an interaction between the disease agent, the host and the environment. And when we're considering multi-host pathogens like canine distemper virus, one of the environmental components um, is actually the relationship of disease reservoirs. So when disease is introduced into a naive population of individuals, um, the transmission of that disease is the driving force of what we call the host pathogen relationship. So individuals in a population who encounter a disease move through this SIR model. So they move from being susceptible to the disease to being infected and then either recovering from the disease and those individuals can contribute to what we call herd immunity or being removed if they, if they succumb to a disease. Okay. Um, the basic reproductive number or the R0 of a pathogen is the average number of secondary infections that can be generated from an um, infectious host in a susceptible population. So I say we've probably been hearing a, a lot about this lately. And in a single host pathogen who follows um, the normal density dependent transmission, as a disease moves through a closed population, um, individual hosts will move through the series of this SIR and as that happens, the number of susceptibles will gradually go down. And this reduces um, to a point where the R0 number drops below one. This is the purpose of all the lockdowns and things that we've, we've all been going through. We're trying to reduce these susceptible hosts. And it can, can be the same for animal diseases as well. So once R0 drops below one, a disease, um, a single host pathogen will normally die out. So single host pathogens are unlikely um, to cause extinction if they follow density dependent transmission. Um, unfortunately, in our multi-host pathogens like CDV, the um, process is a lot more complex. And in the situation of free roaming dogs, we have high population turnover. So our, our number of susceptibles is not constant. They are regularly being replaced. So this is supplying new susceptible hosts into the population and the ability of a multi-host pathogen like CDV to um, infect many different hosts means that it can be maintained in reservoir systems. And this effectively removes those normal disease limiting factors that we've just explained with density dependent transmission. And this means that um, more vulnerable species and particularly isolated endangered wildlife species could actually be at danger of extinction from an infection like this. Multi-host pathogens by their nature affect multiple hosts and this means that some of these populations can act together to form reservoir communities. 
There's been fairly um, confusing and conflicting opinions on the definition of reservoirs. Um, some of the older definitions generally considered that a reservoir um, was not uh, clinically affected by disease, but this is now considered a bit outdated. And probably the most accurate definition of a reservoir comes from um, Hayden et al, 2002. And I'll just read you out the definition of a reservoir that they suggest that it should be considered in direct relation to the target host. So they define a reservoir as being one or more epidemiologically connected populations or environments in which a pathogen can be permanently maintained and from which infection is transmitted to the target population. Now, I've got a little diagram that we'll, we'll just run through a couple of parts. And it's just to explain how things are, are not always as simplistic as we might think. So if we were dealing with distemper, if we take the little model A as an example, if we considered our, our target population, so our population of interest, for example, we'll make the red circle a, a tiger. If we considered them to be our target, and in model A, we've got our um, blue square, if that was our reservoir system of being our free roaming dogs, then we have one source population and one target population. And our source population is the reservoir. Now, if we want to stop transmission and stop risk to our tiger, we just have one chain to break. So if we can break that transmission through that arrow, then we can, we can protect our, our tiger against disease. However, as we said, for multi-host pathogens, it's far more complicated. And the number of different examples right up to E, where in example E, we've got multiple different species, multiple different transmission chains, sometimes going in different directions, and they can all then feed into risk to our target population. And this is where we get into sort of um, reservoir maintenance communities. And if we only focus on one, so if we only then still focus on our dogs, we can see with the, with the grey circles, that's not going to be enough to stop transmission. So the, the point of including this slide is that if we don't understand our reservoir system, then we cannot suitably break the chains of transmission towards our species of interest. OK, so it's quite a lot to cover there, but it's just to introduce some of those concepts if you've, if you've not already come across them. So why is this important for yourselves? Why did I think that we should speak about it today? So um, landlocked in the central Himalayas, your wonderful country has three very, very distinct and ecologically diverse um, geographical regions from your northern Himalayas to the central hills and the southern Terai plains. And what this gives us is a vastly diverse landscape and habitats for, for wildlife. Worldwide, we have seen the effect of this growing human population um, causing the altered land use and deforestation and a reduction in our wildlife habitat. And to use a local example for yourself, the Terai region of Nepal in the 14 years from 1963 um, underwent and suffered 78% of deforestation with that cleared land mainly being used for cultivation. And currently, 61% um, of ungulates and 45% of carnivores are listed as being threatened in the Nepal uh, National Mammal Red Data Book. And the positive to that is that over 23% of the country has now been designated as protected areas. So you've got your 12 national parks, your wildlife reserve, a further six conservation areas, and also the, the one hunting reserve. And these produce habitats for large carnivores and endangered species, which could be at a future risk for CDB transmission. So we've already seen CDB um, occur in wildlife in other countries. It's already causes some losses. So when we look at um, you know, your local situation, it's something that um, you know, we should definitely be aware of. And I know that your, your own wildlife vets who introduced me to the, the topic and the concerns um, are very interested in. So today what I wanted to talk about was a One Health approach to the um, risk from wildlife, uh, risk, sorry, risk to wildlife from CDB infection. 
And this is where um, this One Health approach can be very beneficial to addressing the risks of the conservation of endangered wildlife. And it's the most effective approach uh, to have success. So One Health, as we all know after your, your One Health week, is the consideration of health as being codependent and interlinked between human health, animal health, and also our ecosystem health. And in the case of canine distemper virus, we have to consider both wild animal and domestic animal health, and also actually our ecosystem health and management with relation to human behaviours, which can lead to increased encounters between domestic and wildlife species. So as part of my own um, study and my own master's, I carried out a free roaming dog zero survey at the end of 2019. And that was on 100 dogs from the Chituan National Park buffer zone and surrounding areas. I'm still working to complete that data and hopefully publish on it. So um, I won't be sharing too many more details of that study just now, although I hope that we can maybe catch up on that further down the line. There's currently only one other um, published study from um, CDV in Nepal, which was from the Annapurna Conservation Area. And that study detected 70% of CDV antibody zero prevalence in free roaming dogs. But as we've already mentioned, we obviously have to consider um, in the reservoir sections of the talk today that we have to remember that the dogs may not be the only reservoir. And this has been shown from studies in other countries, although it's still very important to understand the role that our dogs play. So you, as I say, you do have many um, strategies uh, already undergoing with your protected areas and for the wildlife vets, the small animal vets, the NGOs to all work together um, along with protected area managers and also to consider the needs of the buffer zone communities um, and their interaction with, with wildlife and with their domestic animals. This gives us the most successful future strategy to safeguard um, wildlife health. So the work that we've discussed there on, on free roaming dogs and also looking at wildlife, these zero surveys can provide baseline demographic data on um, population of areas and also disease prevalence, which are useful where data is lacking. However, longer term studies are really what's required to understand the endemic and epidemic disease patterns. As we mentioned in that Serengeti study, um, if they hadn't you know, looked back retrospectively, they wouldn't have realised the, the, the true history of how CDV had been in that area. So it's always good if we can build up uh, what we call temporal data, which is data over time, so that we can look at uh, how diseases progress over time. And a cross-species surveillance approach actually allows us to understand whole ecosystem health and adequate disease control options. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that there are currently no published reports of CDB in wildlife in Nepal. However, as the contact between domestic and wild species increases, so does the risk of new patterns of disease emergence, um, which is obviously being seen in other countries. And wildlife managers must be prepared um, for this happening in the future. And it has been seen that countries which conduct wildlife disease surveillance programmes are more likely to identify emerging um, disease threats, emerging diseases, and also to identify zoonotic disease early. And this allows for a more timely response and the implementation of control measures. There will be um, many wildlife health programmes already been undertaken in your own protected areas. And in order to achieve that cross-species surveillance, in addition to you know, the zero surveys that I was involved in, um, for instance, looking at the free roaming dogs, consideration would also need to be given not just to the carnivores of key concern. So, for example, the, the Bengal tiger and the Asiatic wild dog that are some of the, the key carnivores that we would consider, um, but also the smaller carnivores as they could be contributing towards these more complex reservoir systems. So, for example, around Chituan area, the, the golden jackal and the Bengal fox would be would be ones to consider. 
And this can be undertaken through sort of ongoing active or passive surveillance programs. So the, the small carnivores, you know, if, if they are um, come across through passive surveillance, and testing and screening can be really useful. Um, some of the large protected carnivores will have um, periodic interventions for their health. So, you know, sometimes some of these protected species may be radio collared or have interventions for other treatments. And these are really good opportunities for us to take samples. Even if we um, aren't testing them at that time, they can be stored and they can give us a wealth of information um, moving forward. So when it comes to control for CDV, um, when it comes to control for any disease, actually, before any management is undertaken, we should always consider um, whether management is needed at all. So we first of all have to assess what the threat is and whether a management intervention is advisable. And um, secondly, we need to consider whether it's feasible and what the outcome we're expecting. So who are we expecting or, or which species are we expecting to benefit from our interventions? And the goal and methods of measuring our response should always be, be clear from the outset um, so that any success can be monitored and, and changes made if necessary. So when we look at disease control, this is normally aimed at either the host, the pathogen or an environmental component to reduce disease exposure and transmission. In the case of morbillivirus, viruses um, like CDV, there has been previous successes seen with um, a mass control of human measles virus, which has been through vaccination of over 600 million people across 60 countries. And there also was in 2011, the global eradication of rinderpest in cattle following extensive vaccination programs. So there has been previous successes, um, but the more complex with CDV is these um, multi that it's a multi-host pathogen and that we can have these reservoir systems. So understanding of the reservoir systems should really form the foundation of any management decision involving a multi-host pathogen. So the ways that we can look to control disease, um, firstly, we can look at reducing interactions between the source and target hosts to try to reduce disease transmission. Designation of our buffer zone areas are one measure to create a boundary around protected areas, as are further man-made or natural barriers. Reducing host density um, through dog population control has been used for some of our zoonotic disease risks, um, primarily for rabies control, but really does require a clear understanding of transmission and reservoir species. Culling to reduce free roaming dog numbers um, has been shown to be both inhumane and ineffective as a population control measure against human rabies and is now no longer considered acceptable by the OIE. So when we um, have dog culls carried out, it has been seen that the population recovers very rapidly. So there are increased um, reproductive rates to recover that population. And it also involves um, movement. So migration of what we call perturbation of dogs from surrounding areas in to fill that void. So it has been shown in the rabies example to be, to be ineffective and no longer recommended. One thing we really have to remember with uh, the distemper virus side of things, which we touched on on the earlier slides, is hosts who recover from CDV. So if we do a, a dog zero survey and find a high zero prevalence, a large proportion of that will be recovered individuals who are now immune, so who are not a current transmission risk and actually culling of those populations will actually reduce herd immunity and could be counterproductive because as we've seen with the rabies examples, the population will recover, but it will recover then with young, naive individuals. So we're actually increasing the number of susceptibles into that SIR model and potentially worsening uh, transmission risk. So we always have to really understand um, our disease transmission processes and our reservoir systems. If we do feel that we need to reduce dog density, um, this can be done by changing human attitudes towards um, dog ownership for more responsible ownership. 
Um, adequate rubbish control can reduce the amount of, of food available for scavenging and um, population control through fertility interventions like um, humane dog population management with sterilisation or the development of immunocontraceptives. The other ways that we can intervene um, are by reducing disease in the reservoir hosts. There are challenges in vaccinating wildlife and this means that most of our um, reservoir vaccine efforts have tended to be focused on domestic dog reservoirs. And however, although this does obviously benefit dogs by providing them vaccination, difficulties can arise in, re in reaching adequate coverage targets. And this approach obviously fails to address those complex wildlife reservoirs and breaking all of the chains of transmission as we saw in the you know, in the reservoir uh, diagram that we showed. And as I said, you know, we do have immunity in some recovered dogs. So actually um, a lot of vaccination effort might not significantly increase the immunity of, of a high prevalence area. There was a study carried out by Belsier and Gomper in 2015, and they found that CDV vaccination programs in areas with very high seroprevalence failed to significantly improve the proportion of adult dogs with antibodies that were contributing to a herd immunity situation when compared to a control group. So they have suggested that um, potential efforts and the cost associated with CDB dog vaccination programmes may be better aimed at juvenile animals. Um, again, this has to be taken on a case by case basis, depending on the seroprevalence in individual areas and indeed if there is a risk to, to wildlife. So when it comes to the wildlife themselves, we can also look at reducing disease in the target host themselves. And as I said before, vaccination does um, pose challenges in wildlife, and it has in the past been controversial because of um, uncertainties over vaccine safety, duration of immunity, and also a variation in the efficacy of vaccines in wildlife. And there can also be um, challenges in the actual delivery of a vaccine, and it's not, not without associated risks and high cost at times. There have been variable results and safety concerns uh, regarding modified live vaccines, and this has seen the development of recombinant vaccines, and there has been trials carried out on a uh, tiger vaccination against canine distemper virus. And in a study group of six tigers, they compared a recombinant canary pox vectored CD vaccine with a live attenuated vaccine. And although both were without adverse side effects, the live attenuated vaccine provided a stronger and more predictable immunity in that study group of six tigers. So really for future um, further work to actually model the impact of CDV using population viability analysis can be useful. Um, the development of safe wildlife vaccines prior to any further outbreaks would obviously be advantageous uh, for the conservation of endangered species. And this can be alongside a building of that temporal data. So data over time on the zero prevalence of CDV um, both in our domestic and our wild species to improve our understanding of the disease cycles. So in conclusion, CDV is an important multi-host pathogen in the field of conservation medicine, and it could potentially pose a threat of local extinction to endangered wild carnivores. A One Health approach considers both the domestic and the wildlife reservoirs and also the management and disease surveillance of wildlife habitats. And this is required to protect endangered species from important multi-host pathogens like CDV. So thank you so much for your time and for listening today. Um, next couple of slides just show some of the, the kind of key references that I've used in the presentation today. And I would also just like to thank and acknowledge um, a lot of support that I got for my own um, study and everything that I've looked into over the last year, which was a real um, collaboration between a lot of um, organisations, both for myself at home um, and abroad with yourselves. So thank you so much.
Thank you for your wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Inga. Well, I enjoyed your presentation throughout and I'm sure the viewers did as well. So I can see some questions popping up in my screen. So uh, let's move on to the Q&A session, shall we? OK, perfect. Yes. So we have first question from uh, Ashwini Kumar Jha. Ma'am, could you please elaborate through PCR test has Though PCR test has so much benefit in distinguishing the virus, why serum neutralizing test is called a gold standard test? Please give your thoughts on it. Okay, no, thank, thank you for that question because I've maybe not made that clear. So virus neutralization is considered the gold standard of the serological tests. So um, molecular PCR is, is not one of the serological tests and um, that's a different type of test. So our molecular testing definitely gives us more and different information but when it comes to the serological tests the neutralization um, has been described as the gold standard because it can detect the antibodies um, across a wide a wide species of hosts so our more of our bench top tests um, certainly our, our in practice rapid tests and some of the ELISAs and things are not suitable for wildlife um, antibody detection but for serology the neutralization is considered the best, but for molecular testing, the PCR obviously gives us a lot more information. Um, so I hope that hope that clears that for you. Oh, so I, I can't hear you anymore, sorry, but I can read that question. Are you still muted? Hello? Oh, I okay, can moving on to the next question. Sorry for the interruptions. Uh, can a dog still get distemper if vaccinated? Right. So again, that's a really good question. Um, so vaccination is basically um, aimed at stimulating a suitable immune response. So there's a couple of important things with distemper that we have to consider. So first of all, um, in very young dogs, they can sometimes have um, antibody from their mother passed down. So in the, when I did my own research, um, I intentionally excluded dogs that I thought were to be under 16 weeks of age from my study because they may have had antibody showing up as positive, but actually that's what we call maternal antibody, so antibody from the mother, rather than suggesting that they had been infected. It's also considered that if we vaccinate um, young dogs against distemper whilst they might still have maternal antibody that may interfere with their response to vaccination so vaccination relies on the individual having a suitable immune response so once an animal is suitably vaccinated and has had an adequate immune response to a vaccine against distemper then they should be protected and they shouldn't be able to get the disease which is why we've had successful elimination in the uk However, as I said, we don't have free roaming dogs um, and we have very stringent vaccination protocols where the age of dogs being pet dogs is, is known quite accurately. And we give two doses of vaccination after to ensure that we're after that age of maternal antibody. But if you vaccinated a very, very sick or immunosuppressed dog, there is a chance that their response might not be adequate to protect them. But in a healthy individual, above that maternal antibody age, yes, they should be protected by, va by vaccination. Okay, then uh, next question from Prakash Rawal. Is it possible to eliminate canine distemper virus in the future? So it, it is possible, but I hope that you would understand from the talk today that it's, it's not going to be an easy feat. So there has been successes, as I said, with other morbilli viruses like measles virus and rinderpest. The big difference being that um, distemper is a multi-host pathogen and it's got a global distribution. So, you know, I think that the chances of, of elimination are, are going to be very, very difficult. You would have to break every possible transmission chain. And as we showed there with um, the, the problems that we have encountering free roaming dogs, so dogs that are out with human control, it's very hard for us to um, you know, completely eliminate a disease in those situations. It's looking like it could be successful in the rabies example, um, but in the canine distemper, 
think we do have much more impact of these other wildlife reservoirs. And if they are not suitably addressed, then you know elimination attempts won't be successful. And that's why for control, um, we've discussed a number of different things because just trying to vaccinate is probably not going to be sufficient. So we actually potentially need to look at interventions um, at the at risk, you know, actually at the carnivores of key concern are maybe going to be at risk because it's definitely not going to be an easy disease to eliminate because it's got such a global distribution and it affects so many hosts. Okay, ma'am, moving on to the next question from Anil Sharma. Reason of infection of CDV in captive red endangered carnivore? Okay, so, so it has happened. Um, it has happened. There has been situations in zoos where there's been outbreaks in, in multiple species. And you can, there was an instance, now I want to say that it was in Japan. I don't have my notes in front of me, so I apologize if that is incorrect. Um, where there were multiple species inside a zoo detected with a specific lineage of CDV and also some wild animals outside the perimeter of the zoo with the same, the same infection. So when we're dealing with, you know, some degree of, um, you know, aerosol or, or discharge and secretion transfer, when wildlife can move in and out, you know, there is a potential for spread there and, and it, has, it has happened on boundaries. So biosecurity is obviously very, very important as well. Um, there also is potential when you're you know, relocating any animals, whether that be relocations or translocations in the wild um, or bringing animals into a captive environment, or as we spoke about, you know, some of the wildlife trade and things, it's very, very important for all diseases, not just for canine distemper, that we consider the possibility when we're moving any animal from one area to another area, is what else could we potentially be moving with it? And um, so biosecurity is very, very important when it comes to captive animal welfare and health management. OK, ma'am. Next question from Anil Sharma. As it's a cosmopolitan, is there any united effort taken by different organization of different countries to eradicate the disease? So as far I'm, I'm not fully, fully aware of the, the kind of world situation of this to answer that question. Um, but as, as far as I'm aware at the moment, you know, a lot of research and a lot of interest is, has come into this area. Um, there's not quite the same historical research or um, financial input because it's not a human disease in the same way that rabies is. But there is certainly a lot of collaborative efforts um, you know, between a number of, of different organisations and uh, different research communities to build up data and, and understanding. Um, even my own my own project, which was a very, very tiny, tiny, tiny project, um, but I had input from people in the UK, from your own um, wildlife vets, uh, Dr. Amir at NTNC in Nepal, um, and even actually from um, other veterinary surgeons that are now going to be doing some more work uh, from Cornell University as well, who have set up some testing capabilities in Nepal. So there is definitely a worldwide interest in this, and hopefully that will come on to build, build more and more knowledge about it for the future. Okay, next question uh, from Anil Sharma again. How long does it take for a vaccinated dog to gain immunity against CDV? So again, kind of touching on what we said on the on the last questions, you know, that is dependent on, on the immune status and the ability of that individual to mount a proper immune response. Um, our vaccination schedules at home are normally uh, two injections, two weeks apart. And if the individual is um, you know, old old enough, so we give we give the second injection at 10 to 12 weeks of age. And we normally expect good good immunity within a, within a week or two after those those injections, and um, so they can they can certainly normal healthy individuals can mount a good immune response and be protected fairly quickly. So I think that's all the questions uh, for now. And uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, coming to uh, this uh, very uh, last session of the One Health webinar series as a speaker. And uh, 
and I must tell you this, uh, many students from Pakriyava, uh, they have heard about you and are very enthusiastic to meet you as well. So on the behalf of IVSC Pakriyava family and all the students from Pakriyava, I'd like to invite you to our college. Oh, thank you so much. And I very much hope that, uh, that the current uh, tra you know, travel problems and things, I don't know when I'll be traveling again, but I very much hope that we get the chance to um, travel again and, and be back and you know, maybe, maybe look at some other sessions. Uh, and thank you so much for asking me to speak today. I hope it's been interesting and useful for you. Yes, ma'am. We are very excited to meet you in person as well and um, hope to see you there soon. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, so it's the end of the first session. So now uh, we have a presentation from uh, Mr. Abhishek Kharga, who is currently working as a program manager, a program manager in Bolu Nepal Nutrition Initiative, and also the country representative uh, in YPR Nepal. And he will be presenting on. Um, uh, why, uh, sorry, YPR uh, Nepal Asia Pacific. So I'd like to invite him on the floor. Um, let's welcome Mr. Abhishek Karga. Um, Dai, the floor is all yours. Okay. Um, I'm trying to make my, is my screen full screen there? No. Yes. I think I it's visible. I think now it's full screen, right? Okay, hello uh, to the third day of the webinar series. And uh, thank you, Inga, for a, such a wonderful presentation. I learned a bit more because I'm not a veterinarian. I'm a food technologist, but somewhere, some um, I, I would also like to meet you someday in the future. I hope we can uh, attend, I hope to attend your webinar in the coming days also. The last thing. Uh, okay, I'm going to share something about Asia Pacific. Why I'm saying sharing about Asia Pacific is that the webinar series is initially targeted for Nepal, but as I said, the audience range they are more about global. So I'm uh, sharing more about the Asia Pacific uh, reflections. So what is uh, uh, what we are doing in the Asia Pacific level? So in the Asia Pacific level, these are the nations who are in YPAR. YPAR is uh, stands for Young Professionals for Agriculture Development. Earlier, it was a Youth Professionals Platform for Agriculture Research and Development, and it was just shortened to Young Professionals for Agriculture Development. And but the acronym is the same uh, as earlier. So it's a loose network. Uh, it was hosted by GFAR in the earlier. Now it's been hosted by FIBL in. Uh, uh, Switzerland and uh, its regional office in, in Asia Pacific is in China, where in Beijing is hosted by Chinese Academy of Agriculture Science, uh, and the Nepal chapter has been hosted by Nepal Food Scientists and Technology Association. So, this is a brief about the YPAR, how it's been operating. So, we have uh, these many chapters. So, in the Asia Pacific, uh, this is our team. Uh, Wiper is a Pacific team. Uh, Ms. Dr. Jing Bi is the is a Pacific coordinator, uh, uh, and these are all other members from China, from Nepal, from uh, Iran, from uh, Mongolia, from Uzbek, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. So we have our team is uh, from almost all sites of Asia, Asia and the Pacific. So talking about the Wiper is a Pacific. Uh, YPAR do have does have around twenty thousand member registered member. If you have not registered to YPAR, please do register at www.ypar.net. And where uh, in Asia Pacific only India and Nepal are such country where there are more than thousand members. Uh, and globally also Nepal ranks. Nepal was ranked in twenty nineteen in fourth position. Uh, let's see the 2021, 2020 annual report due to COVID. Uh, the annual report has been. Uh, Pending, um, as I said already, the, it's been hosted by Chinese Academy of Agriculture Science in Beijing, China, and we either emit or face-to-face -face meet annually. Uh, some of the programs of the Asia Pacific region I would like to highlight. Just like this is the YPAR Philippines program uh, mentorship program. This is the online mentorship program, and the uh, next one is 
sorry, the earlier one was offline mentorship programs. Like they, they gather with the participants and they share uh, to farmers, they learn from the farmers and uh, interact with each other. The next one is the online mentorship program. This was the EDU Mala program. How many of you have known uh, EDU Mala program in the past, the wiper? So this was the mentorship toolkit that was developed from Wipar Global uh, with uh, GFAR and other donors. And this one's typical of Wipar Nepal mentorship program at the Basra Barahi. Uh, two Wipar Nepal members were sent to the Makwanpur area and interact with the farmer groups. So why, what Wipar did, uh, Wipar either uh, organizes or co-organizes for the workshops and conference. This one is of Waipat Pakistan. Yeah, it's the Waipat Pakistan. And this one is uh, Waipat Bangladesh. Uh, this one is the Waipat Philippines. This one is of Waipat Nepal. And this one is of Waipat India. So either we are making youths to engage in agriculture from either electronic medium or from face-to-face -face medium or interact with them uh, very easily and we are also uh, mentoring them mentoring them in a very simple way in a very cost effective way and lastly this is the uh, wiper nepal uh, wiper nepal where it, it uh, worked as a communication partner for the eighth national food conference on science and technology now collaboration yeah uh, there are lots of collaboration with the wiper uh just like uh, wipar uh, bangladesh part, uh, partner with the uh, ingenious program uh just like wipar nepal also partner university of florida on uh, extending our research feed the future livestock innovation F livestock innovation feed the future of livestock innovation lab uh this was a symposium for two days and i think uh, suba suba was also a pa uh, participant in that program along with me and other wipardians and this is the FAO Biodiversity Program, which is held in Bangkok. Three Wiper representatives were uh, nominated for this program. Uh, Ms. Asta Busal, Mr. Ryan Lee, and Mr. Sahabir Rai uh, from Nepal, China, and Bhutan, respectively. So we are uh, about to form maize, um, sorry, we're about to form Biodiversity Youth Tax Force. So if you are interested, keep uh, get yourself updated to Wiper. We'll soon publish about the Biodiversity Youth Tax Force. And this one was the where uh, I got chance to get part in uh, uh, youth participant agriculture rice systems uh, in the Nairobi, Kenya. And we worked for Erie, uh, how youth can be involved in uh, rice systems because uh, the gender perspective has been included for such a long time now. Uh, even big uh, research organizations like Iri are also thinking to involve youths in uh, uh, rice systems, rice-based uh, rice agriculture food systems. And this one is the um, program for uh, Wipart Pakistan, where they were, uh, there was a panel discussion of strategies of ensuring food security and climate change. This was a big program last year. And uh, this one was in, held in Nepal uh, with collaboration of uh, Germany, IGG, where they are uh, working with um, how we can ensure food and nutrition security through kitchen gardening uh, from H4GRR. So there were participants from Nepal, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Germany, and some of the other neighboring countries of Southeast Asia. So what we do is we strengthen our network by disseminating information, uh, information among the respective country network. We publish in the wipe uh, site so that uh, other country representatives could copy it or replicate it or could modify it in a better way so that uh, that gives a good results in their country chapters. And uh, you can find the resource of Wipar Asia Pacific. Just click in the link, uh, asia.wipar.net. You can click in elaborate later on. Or you can, as well as you can see the blogs of Wipar, uh, just click uh, asia.wipar.net slash blog. You can see all the blogs of Wipar over there. Or if you want to see not only Asia Pacific, you can see the rest of all blogs of the uh, Wipar. You can just uh, go wipar.net and click the blog. Uh, you can find all the blogs. The blogs uh, can blogs are very 
diverse type from livestock, from agriculture, from climate change, from uh, rural livelihoods, from uh, women involvement in agriculture. So it can be very much interesting for you to reading that blogs, uh, blogs and might be in future works also. So some of our partners, IRI, FAO, uh, CIMIT, and CAS, partners in the mean, in the sense that they are not funding fully, but they are uh, involving WIPAR in some of the activity. Like WIPAR is a voluntary organization, and so we don't expect any fund, but WIPAR is giving its expertise to these donors currently, uh, how youths can be uh, engaged in agriculture in a very good manner. So, uh, Inga, if you are listening to me, uh, I think we can partner in the future also. Yeah, I saw your organization somewhere in the back of your presentation uh, poster. So uh, we'll be happy to partner with you or give our expertise feedback in the coming future also. And if you have any email, the, uh, if you have any query, you can just uh, you can just send me in Skype, Viber, WhatsApp, whatever you use in a, uh, chatting platforms. And the email is the Viper Asia Pacific Communication Coordinator, Mr. Dinesh Pandey. So he will respond most of the emails of Asia Pacific Communications. Thank you, everyone. Emma, you are mute. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Abhishek, for your um, wonderful and brief presentation. Uh, I'm sure many participants got to know more about YPR uh, through this presentation. So now moving on to the next session, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Sujit Shah as the speaker for the second session. So I'd like to invite Dr. Shah for his uh, presentation. And hello. 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 Uh, Dr. Shah, the floor is all yours. OK, I'm trying to fix everything right now. Mm. Okay. Just wait. Um, just wait. So my slide is on. Hello, hello to everybody. Can you hear? Yes, yeah, I'm Sujit. Yes, sir. I'm Sujit. Sir. Uh, I'm a friend of Abhishek. You see, and he invited me for this uh, uh, talk. So I'm very um, thankful to him. Uh, he has uh, given me an invitation to uh, really interact with you all. My my work is in the plant-based science, but uh, today I'm talking more on the health, diet, and exercise. This is quite different than what I do, but still I have some kind of idea on this. So I would really like to share what I I learned during my uh, my career apart from what I do. Uh, so health, diet, and exercise. It is quite. Uh, quite uh, familiar to us and everybody knows what is health and what is diet and exercise why we need to do why need to we need to follow up all these things but still there are so many uh, things that are uncovered in daily life of uh, so that we we don't follow it well and we don't we don't have that much of understanding what what health can be benefited by the diet, how the health can be benefited by diet or exercise. Uh, just to, we have a surface kind of knowledge on this. So uh, to just to brush up our knowledge, I, I would like to share my slides. Uh, <clears throat> so we all know this, this health and exercise and diet are uh, interlinked and they are, uh, they, they, they are there for, for everyone with their uh, culture, with their with their social activities, with their uh, kind of living. So for a normal people, the diet and exercise would be quite different than the 
for the for the athlete or for the professional players so i'm talking much more for the uh, normal people so that everybody can understand what the diet should be and what the exercise should be in the regular daily life <clears throat> so coming to the health health can be of very physical or mental uh, physical sound sleep body weight blood pressure this should be all in the normal range so that we can say that the body is uh, in a healthy condition similarly if you have a good mental mentally sound emotionally you are you are much uh, uh, happy joy and and you are able to um, avoid the negative aspect of the life then you are said to be mentally uh, healthy so we can uh, coin this health into two two uh, subtype physical and mental <clears throat> coming to the diet we say that what we eat what we are so what whatever we eat that that reflects on our daily activities daily um, workout how we think how we uh, do our uh, work it is all related to our health a diet so 95 percent of our health issues is just because of our bad habit of eating so if we manage to do this if we manage to control our diet understand our what we take can reflect on our health issue then 95 percent of chance we are we are avo avoiding the health hospital follow up and all so uh, all the illness is coming from the food so we can say that five percent would be uh, uncertain that could be of serious kind of uh, diseases that is uh, other than because of diet so food habit good food habit good food timing intermediate fasting unprocessed food whole grains vegetables fruits and moderate amount of fats and protein are 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 somewhere somewhat called as a good food food habit carbs should must be whole grain fiber from the vegetables and the fruits so uh, carbohydrate must be uh, something like which is which which is not processed uh, i mean to say that which contains all kind of fibers and which are which which are natural unprocessed uh, which the unprocessed food are those junk food or those foods coming from the factories and this should be quite avoided to have a good health so if you call carbohydrate uh, what does it do is that it give you instant energy instant energy is because the glucose release faster if we take a carbohydrate so the spike uh, sugar blood sugar gets spike spike up and this leads to a uh, different kind of oxidative damage this this would be a neuro neurogenerative disease neuroinflammation insulin resistant these are all because of high spike in the blood sugar a normal sugar level doesn't do this <coughs> different uh, disease causing stuff but if the sugar level goes up then this can happen so main cause of diabetes it is a main cause of diabetes anxiety stress overweight blood pressure so if you if you link the sugar with with the diabetes it is obviously we all know but anxiety and stress are always related to the carbohydrate I, I, if i say a carbohydrate it is refined sugar a refined sugar can dissolve into blood uh, in a second so that it produce it spikes the sugar level and that sugar level damages our um, our neuron system and that can cause uh, anxiety stress and other neurogenerative diseases as well apart from the diabetes so we we know that from our graduate level we know that there is no such essential carbohydrate required for the food source we have all read this but fibers whole grains are good source of vitamins and minerals so we must take a fiber containing whole grains uh, avoiding the sugar so i have given a link of of how the sugar affects the brain health uh, a youtube uh, documentary i i hope 
this will really clarify our doubt how the sugar can be uh, addictive, toxic, and that can and lead to a different kind of diseases. So, so this this will really help how what I wanted to project in this uh, presentation. So similarly, proteins, we know that there are essential pro uh, amino acids we need to acquire from the, our diet. And these amino acids are all uh, useful for the metabolic pathway, neurotransmitter production, like serotonin, dop dopamine, are all related to the essential amino acid production. So recommended dose for protein um, is 56 gram per, per day for men and 46 gram per women. Uh, too much pro, too much of the protein intake can con convert into a carbohydrate so what i mean to say is that if you take much of protein in your diet then excess of protein won't go for this um, metabolic pathway but it will reverse back to a glucose or a carbohydrate syn uh, synthesis process that will again convert into a fat so so one way of be becoming a fat is because of uh, taking in over intake of carbohydrate or, or protein as well because it it will uh, the 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 end pro, uh, at the end the the reservoir of these fats are coming from the protein and the carbohydrate but uh, if intake of much protein can cause acidosis kidney disease as well Again, coming to the fats, we, there is a lot of controversy with the fats. Fats can be a good fats, bad fats. Fats can be an energy source. Uh, and, uh, and they are slow, slowly, uh, uh, they don't spike the blood sugar as that compared to the uh, glucose or carbohydrate. So we have essential fats as we have essential proteins but we don't have essential carbohydrate. So uh, chief source of the hormone production uh, and the fats, when, we, when the fat is broken down into a small uh, fragment, the simplest form is called ketone bodies. These are the clean form of, of energy. These clean form of energy are used by the brain. So in this case, there is no oxidative damage. There is no formation of free radical that can and cause a mutation or gene expression. So ketones are the good source of energy for the brain. And these ketones are formed when we are starved or we are doing an intermediate fasting. So intermediate fasting is good for fat burning. So that way we are getting energy as well as we are losing our weight. So um, intake of omega fatty acids, saturated fatty acids is recommended for the essential, essential for the good health. So these are found in the key, nuts, avocados, pumpkin seeds, uh, chai seeds, unprocessed mustard, peanuts oil, and uh, fish oils contain good number of fats. And these are unsaturated fat as well. So, so fats uh, helps in, in absorption of minerals and and they are 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 the source for the uh, neuron nerves development so uh, nervous system development the fats has good uh, uh, role important role similarly they are uh, essential for blood clotting muscle movement inflammation so uh, for a long term um, good fat must be included that possess mono unsaturated, polysaturated, unsaturated fats. Bad ones would be the industrial processed fat. These are trans fats. So we must eliminate this from our diet. So saturated fats comes in between. It can, it has a moderate uh, benefits. <coughs> so eating good foods rich in the trans fat increases uh, the high amount of LDL cholesterol uh, reduce reduce the beneficial SDL cholesterol. So it can cause a different kind of diseases, chronic to uh, chronic and heart disease, diabetes as well. So so they are they contribute to the insulin resistance as well. So fats. Uh, common source of fats are saturated fats from the red meat, milk products, and the coconut oils and cheese. Uh, <coughs> the diet rich in saturated fats would, uh, would drive up our cholesterol levels. So saturated fats must be recommended at 10% of our calorie is a day. 
so it is it comes in between so it can cause a serious heart disease as well but the good mono unsaturated fat polysaturated fats are recommended these are omega 3 fatty acid omega 6 fatty acids this must be included in our diet so that our our health is benefited so it 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 help to prevent the different serious diseases like heart disease stroke uh, rising sdl lowering of the triglyceride polysaccharides and as well so <coughs> coming to this uh, term neurogenesis and neuroplasticity so at, back to our school days we all were taught that neurons or ne neurons doesn't multiply once we grow old adult the neuron that what we have is will be fixed this would be the number of neurons but it is not true by now we we'll, we we understand that neuron multiply as we are doing as we are doing good uh, as we are doing taking a good diet good exercise the neuron multiplies uh, if we don't do any of those things then neurons start degrading and causes serious illness so diet and, and exercise has direct link up with the neurogenesis so neurogenesis is there are 100 billion of neurons 1 trillion ganglion so uh, neurogenesis is a process by which the new neurons is formed from the neural stem cells so loss of neuron is thought to be irreversible but now we can say that the loss of neuron can be uh, uh, compensated by uh, by improving our health system health condition by improving our diet by improving our exercise daily activities so that our neurogenesis keep on um, multiplying so we can so this this is to the old age not just for the adult but to when we are growing older still our nerves neurogenesis occurs so in adult neurogenesis is a process of generating functional neuron from the adult neuron precursor occurs throughout our life in restricted brain region or in mammals so it 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 really says that all these are from citation it's not from what i'm saying is it all from the reference uh, references so neurons generates itself replicates itself but it needs to be given a condition environment so that it can happen so <laughs> neurogenesis how, how can neurogenesis occur it's all about diet exercise meditation yoga so uh, food source for neurogenesis would be intake of flavonoids rich diet dark chocolate blueberries blueberries are also containing a high amount of antioxidant flavonoids uh, polyphenols so blueberries uh, list the top in neurogenesis increase in omega 3 fatty acid they, they are also uh, also important for this neurogenesis curcumin from the turmeric these are all Mm, important for the uh, neurogenesis broccoli or uh, cruciferous vegetables are very important uh, sprouts of broccoli are very important for neurogenesis polyunsaturated fatty acid they are very important for neurogenesis so so much we take this in, in regular diet our ability to uh, memorize our ability to um, learn new things new things good sleep uh, deprived of uh, sleep this can be avoided stress can be managed anxiety can be managed and we will feel young from the inside so it will also directly link up with our working ability if you are working for 10 hours you can maintain that ability of working 10 hours if we have a good diet that will boost our uh, brain system so one thing is neurogenesis other is neuroplasticity so now the now the brain is is considered to be a plastic is is that still elastic that we can can, can reverse it back to a, a good shape from the adverts or the bad situation so it's all depends on our way of thinking diet and um, and learning uh, ability so so there are if we, if you are in a psychological condition that we are not able to understand 
or figure out some, something, then our brain starts going to that uh, in, in, uh, that network. But if we start uh, performing a good uh, learning skill or or influence uh, from the our our society or so, uh, social uh, interaction, then the brain starts connect making a new circuit, new network of uh, understanding, so that our brain start growing, reorganizing well. So neuroplasticity is all about learning new new things, learning with the environment with the interaction and and making a new neuro uh, neuron uh, circuit so the so neuroplasticity is a new new way of understanding the brain system so and now coming to the gut fitness so so gut fitness is new is a evolving area of research uh, so gut fitness has direct link up with the diet, direct link up with the, our way of thinking, uh, anxiety, depression. So God, if, if the gut is fit, then only we can have a good uh, physical health, mental health. And this all comes from the diet and it has a key role in shaping up our health. So, so it is estimated that it is it is 10 to uh, 10 times uh, uh, um, larger than our uh, total cells in our body. So microbes that are residing in our guts, our human human microbes, this is 10 times more than that of our cell, our cell. So it's estimated that it would be a two to three kg of bacteria in, in a normal human. So uh, if, we, if, we, if a person is 70 kg, then it, he must possess a 3 kg of bacteria in his gut or overall um, human body. So among about 1,000 bacterial species colonize in our gut. And the dominant is bacteroid, um, Clostridium, Fuco, Fuco, Clostridium, and uh, these all bifidobacterium, these are all dominant species of uh, species and genera. But having said that, most of our gut bacteria are, are not being mm, culturable. They are there in our gut, but we cannot culture them in our laboratory. So we can't say that these are only the dominant uh, bacteria in our gut, but there might be a uh, more than that we are estimating so gut bacteria can be um, anaerobic or aerobic so anaerobic bacteria are hard to be cultured on the, so uh, lower degree we have e coli and lactobacillus so lactobacillus and e coli are more culturable in the uh, in our um, laboratory system in vitro system so how does uh, this colonization happen it can happen more by the mode of uh, uh, delivery when the baby is born. Uh, so vaginal birth and assi assisted de delivery. So we often are asked uh, when the baby is taken to the hospital, uh, is, is, is the baby being delivered normally or it, it was by the surgery? So uh, we can see the immunity of the babies uh, born by normal is quite different than the immunity of baby born by assistant delivery. So this is all because of microbes. So whenever uh, the baby is delivered by the assistant delivery, they are again uh, colonized, again brushed up. Their skin are been uh, inoculated with the vaginal uh, um, fluid containing microbes, beneficial microbes, so that the immunity can boost up in the uh, young born, uh, in the infant. Or breastfeeding. Breastfeeding also contain large number of microbes that can uh, colonize the bacteria, uh, colonize the gut of 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 an infant, and that that will stay for a long. Yes. Level of sanitation, exposure to antibiotics. Antibiotics are those that will really degrade our gut health. It can uh, it can kill many beneficial bacteria. Body spectrum antibiotics it must not be recommended. Uh, if it is recommended, it should be in a in a critical condition or in a condition where it's it must be taken. But for us normal or or for 
for a kind of a cough and cold uh, this kind of stuff it should not be taken uh, it should be taken like a, a nutraceutical like medicinal plants this would really help to uh, overcome those kind of uh, illness but taking antibiotic every time for us for a minor illness is not good so one of the example of beneficial microbes is bifidobacterium infantis and fecally bacterium that has shown to uh, induce our immunity when anti-inflammatory cyto cytokine so production so this is related to the immunity so these these bacteria are uh, important for uh, for to boost our immunity by regulating t cells Similarly, there are therapeutic application of gut microbes, boosting immunity, boosting the digestion, uh, application for treating cancer treatment, and like um, Helicobacterium pylori for gastric cancer. And there are many or more microbes that have been investigated for treatment of cancer uh, that, that can suppress the uh, cancer uh, causing genes. Uh, similarly, fecal oral transplantation uh, are been done in the uh, are are been done and are in the clinical uh, stage uh, to uh, to treat gastrointestinal diseases, including colitis, constipation, irritation of bowel syndrome, neurology, neurological conditions, and such multiple sclerosis and Parkinson. So, gut fitness linked with the health link to gut fitness linked to the brain fitness. So we say that gut is a second brain. Why we say that? It produces all kinds of hormones, neurotransmitters required, vitamins required for our proper functioning of health and health. So, so it is called as a second brain. It contains a high healthy micro population. The gut fitness is by the diet. So healthy like is to have a gut fitness so it is a key for the mood brain function hormone and vitamin production probiotic diet help to keep our gut microbes healthy so kefir one of the most important kind of probiotic it's like a curd but god and god or yogurt and kefir is quite different. If uh, cod, yogurt con contain one or two or five beneficial bacteria, whereas uh, kefir may contain more than 50 beneficial bacteria, uh, 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 mainly lactobacillus, lactococcus, streptococcus, and leucoconostoc. Uh, so these are fungus, these are bacteria. <coughs> so we can say that kefir uh, comprise of both uh, fungi and the um, uh, bacteria that will help to boost our uh, our my gut microbes that will help ultimately uh, to have a good health. So kefir must be uh, must be industrialized produced in our country as well. We don't have a system of having a kefir in our country, but uh, hope so in coming days. So uh, most of our um, industries would based on this kind of uh, uh, probiotic form, uh, production. So this is also why we must drink kefir. Kefir contains both bacteria and fungi. These are all beneficial uh, bacteria and fungi. What it does to our body, it helps to um, control microbes. It is antimicrobial. It has immunomodulation activity. It is anti-allergic. It, it is it is good for the fat metabolism. It is anti-carcinogenic. So uh, carcinogenic uh, agent can be eliminated from our body. It has a wound healing activity as well. So it, it produces a lot of health benefits. So we must drink so, such probiotics in our, even we know these fermented foods like Gundruk um, in Nepali, these are very good for our health. So we must, uh, we must use this kind of pickles and gundruk in our diet uh, in day-to-day -day life so that our health got benefits. So what does the exercise do? Exercise truly helps our body overall. Whatever you eat, 
whatever you are not able to digest or how the mood is, the yoga or the exercise will really help you. Mindfulness is to be a happy and this all comes by the exercise. Breath, breathing, breathing exercises is very good for brain, gut and lung functions. So it, it totally helps you to uh, maintain a good health. So, so overall, uh, after you eat, after you do all, all those bad stuff, but still if you do all exercise, there is some way or other way you are controlling your daily routine. But diet is very much essential along with the exercise. We can't skip the diet and continue with the exercise. This won't help you to lose the body weight as well. So, so it's very important for our neurotransmitter, neurotransmission formation, vitamin B complex formation, got microbes population health. So yoga or exercise or deep breathing, we know, all know that 22 to 23% of energy is all consumed by brain. And most of this is in oxygen are also consumed by brain. So breathe, breathe breathing exercise is most significant for the good health. So while I say this, I, I, there was a study, there was a study uh, which was published in Frontier of Human Neuroscience. Uh, they they did, did the comparative analysis of gray matter volume and the brain size between the person who does the yoga for uh, for daily routine and who doesn't do. And what they found that uh, the person who is doing the yoga for, for a long time, the, the gray matter is protected and is not declined as compared to the control. So from this experiment, we can say that really uh, these exercises are very important for our cognitive behavior, behavior for our uh, psychological behavior for our mm, stress management for for our health management and overall management of our entire day so we must include these things in our daily routine uh, so similarly it helps in 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 in, for, in maintaining the gut microbes uh, hormonal balance weight loss neurogenesis yoga has yoga or exercise has uh, direct link up with neurogenesis and neuroplasticity so there i have to put a link of how yoga of science this is in the youtube you must watch it it is by the experts not by the uh, by the uh, ordinary people with these are by the done by the experts in their laboratory then they have understood why the yoga or exercise is quite many more of yoga so i would recommend you to uh, look at this youtube documentary so that you can uh, really understand what i wanted to present in this uh, uh, session so discussion the diet a uh, typically high fiber carbohydrate protein uh, good fats should be in, should be in balance should be in balance in our diet uh, typically mediterranean diet are recommended. Mediterranean diet is something like our Nepal Nepali diet. We all do, <coughs> we all do have this uh, whole grain system. Uh, if we are eating, eating a rice, we our uh, flour, we we not we are not taking a highly processed uh, 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 carbohydrates. It's all our uh, whole grain. But still, we overcook some of our vegetables. This should be avoided. We should have a raw vegetables, tomatoes, uh, and this uh, less carbohydrate content, more of fiber content, more of fiber carbohydrate, and protein should be inc included in the, our diet. So uh, avoiding of junk food, trans fat should be uh, rec are recommended. Probiotics are very important for the gut microbes function. Yoga and exercise helps to manage our overall health. So this was my presentation for today. I hope I I was able to make you understand. Thank you. Thank you. You can stop sharing, sir. 
thank you for your detailed and very insightful presentation sir i bet uh, many participants learned a lot and have benefited uh, extensively from your presentation today so now uh, let's uh, move towards q and a session uh, Uh, dear, uh, dear participants, if you have any questions, then uh, you can drop in the comment section. So we have a first question from Anil Sharma. Uh, tell your opinion on the intake of whey protein. Uh, so please uh, unmute your mic. Uh, yes sir. okay uh, whey protein uh, I, I really don't know that much of whey protein i didn't uh, go for the uh, inside of it uh, in my presentation but i hope the whey protein is uh, some way uh, kind of fermented uh, by product so it, it can be taken as a um, probiotics uh, uh, but uh, I really don't know uh, right now. Okay, we have next question from Anil Sharma again. Does disturbance in sleeping pattern affects health? Yeah, they do. They do uh, disturb the sleeping pattern affects overall. There are research on sleeping pattern uh, on uh, overall health that uh, that that. Uh, that are much much more likely to be with the gut microbes. Yeah, sleeping pattern and gut microbes are interlinked. So if we have a disturbance in sleeping pattern, there must be a, a kind of disturbance in our gut population. It's there in the literature. So there 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 is a correlation between uh, microbes and sleeping pattern. Uh, it's, it's all about uh, the stress and this is truly linked uh, so we must uh, recommend uh, exercise and the diet for this uh, to have a sound sleep you are mute i suppose Sorry, sir. Uh, should we eat before or after the exercise and your recommendations on food intake? Yeah, uh, the, the yoga or exercise. We, we should not eat before yoga or exercise. It should be one hour after our exercise, then we can eat. This is uh, all daily, daily stuff. So uh, every yoga guru says that to take, uh, to take break one uh, one hour break before we eat before we do an exercise this has been recommended <laughs> but uh, here i want to say that this were from my learning experience i am not expert in this field uh, but still if you can if you have such queries you can google it and you can make your own uh, understanding about uh, uh, your daily routine pattern I would suggest that way because I am from the uh, plant microbe uh, research part. Uh, I, would be, I would be doing such kind of research in my future, but, but right now I'm not the expert to ex answer this kind of stuff. Uh, so, you know, so, you, so the daily routine would be ba based on your own, own, own uh, experience. I suppose, well, how you experience with the your daily uh, diet and exercise. Again, your mic is mute. So, uh, so I have a question. Uh, 
uh, it's my personal question in case of uh, operated uh, individuals uh, uh, can uh, they follow the exercise uh, routine so what uh, will be the exercise routine in such uh, individuals Pardon, I didn't get your question. What will be the effect if uh, they start their exercise routine sooner or later? For the oldest people? For operated individuals. What does that Operation, mean? Uh, Op in case of... Yes, sir. Operation. Okay. Uh, that's what I... I'm not that much uh, expert on this field. What I, I learned from my own experience is that diet has a crucial effect on your uh, entire body system in, as well as excess. So it has proper, for proper functioning, these are to be taken. But uh, operation is kind of different thing, how the operation is, how, what is the level of these things. So uh, on that serious note, we, we cannot uh, say that this is to be recommended or that is to be recommended. It's up to the um, uh, physician or up to uh, how, how what, what is the casualty level, what is uh, their experience for the diet or what is their experience for the exercise. So this is not uh, for us to decide for those kind of, but for, for the oldest people, for youngster who want to have a memory side, who want to be uh, in a high level of health, that for them, I suggest this, these are the things should, that should be in, in, incorporated in the diets to avoid the doctor follow-up. I'm not there for after the doctor follow-up. I'm there for um, before the doctor follow-up. Never say no to the doctor. That is my presentation theory. So if you think that uh, after you, do, you want to avoid the doctor, yeah, you must start from today to may formulate your diet to do an exercise, these are only things that will help you to um, avoid these things. I said to you in the first in the first slide, ninety five percent of our health issues are just because of diet and uh, on, we are not doing any, any excess. These are all all related with the health issues, and there is no nothing like a physician role here. There is your role or my role to uh, overcome this situation. So uh, the so pharmaceutical company and these are things that is uh, that should not be in our circle. These are these are for everyone to be benefited. So so to avoid the hospital follow up doctor. See so this for this note I am talking, not for those things. Okay, sorry, I get that. Uh, uh, so this uh, okay. Um, I'd like to thank you for accepting our invitation uh, for as a speaker in today's session. And um, it was a great pleasure and privilege to have you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so this was the end of the second session. And uh, we are very near to the end of the session. And uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Abhishek Kharka uh, who will be declaring the winner for the online storytelling competition and uh, officially uh, ending this program. And I'll be taking my leave. Uh, thanks, Pema, for moderating the whole decision. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined the webinar series. Uh, thanks, uh, Rakesh. Thanks, uh, Inga. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, Manoj. Thanks, Sajit. Everyone. Uh, who made this all three days uh, webinar a great learning for all of us because the audience were from very diverse field. And so I got opportunity to learn something from veterinarians and some veterinarians got a chance to learn something from nutrition, some environment. So it was a good learning for me. I hope you also learned something very, very new. Okay. And apart from that, I'm going to announce uh, the winner of the online storytelling contest. Uh, to be honest, everyone were everyone, every submission was superb. It was very hard us to judge, but it's the always we have to find the top three participants. So the third candidate is Miss um, Powell. 
Monta. She is from BSc AG, Agriculture and Forestry University. Congratulations, Miss Monta Podil. And please uh, contact to Miss Subhashri Sharma after you need, after uh, for the further process. Now, the first runner up. The first runner up is uh, Mr. Ariel Sisir. He is currently studying in studying Bachelor in Veterinary Science and Animal Husbandry, first semester IAS Paktihawa. A big congratulations to you. Please contact Ms. Subhasri for further processing. And the most awaited position, uh, the best storytelling, uh, storytelling, online storytelling winner is Barsa Vista. Uh, from BSC AG, IAS Paklihawa. Uh, congratulations, Barsa. So that was the online storytelling competition. And uh, it was, uh, please, as I said earlier also, please contact Ms. Subhasri Sarma for further processing. And uh, she will guide you for further uh, what to do next uh, in the, to claim the award and all. And uh, apart from that, uh, YPAD and IVSA had collaborated in the earlier, uh, earlier years, years also, just like with uh, veterinary conference, uh, sorry, Feed the Future Vet, uh, Livestock Innovation Lab, uh, YPAD Nepal and IVSA Rampur have jointly worked together. Uh, ap apart from that, the webinathon in past March, where the four leading networks of Nepal, YPAD, IVSA, uh, IBS in Nepal, Climates in Nepal, uh, and, and and I forgot one. Um, what part? IBS in and IAS Nepal uh, collaborated for the five-day-long webinar series. That was of initiation of webinar during the uh, COVID lockdown, and now also IBS and White Part has uh, initiated next uh, next program uh, webinar on sorry webinar series on One Health. Uh, it, uh, I hope there's a good learning for you, for all of us. Uh, we, ho I hope uh, IVS and Nepal collaborate in the future coming days uh, for a big webinars or big uh, conference or symposium, whatever they say, but let this COVID end. I'm always waiting COVID, waiting because we have some more programs coming up in webinar, not online, it's a basically offline program. Uh, keep uh, keep patience on that. We'll be soon posting on ypart.net or ypart official group also. Uh, just keep stay tuned. Thank you everyone for making all these trades success. And last but not least, I'll also thank uh, Mr. Sachin Sreshta. Uh, Sachin Sreshta for uh, Sachin Sreshta for um, providing the stream yard uh, for us. Uh, such a big heart, man. Thank you for uh, Thank you for uh, providing Wipart such a memorable uh, uh, such um, thank for Wipart for stream ad so that we can do some of uh, panel discussion or online discussion in this COVID period. Also, we have done uh, some programs like this. So in the near future, also uh, we always like to remember our well wishers, uh, well wishers also. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay safe and keep. Uh, keep get self, get yourself updated in ypart.net or IBSA IBS in Nepal and uh, just share opportunities also so that uh, share the opportunities so that we can uh, participate or collaborate in the future upcoming days. Thank you everyone. Stay safe. Bye.